Uh, Stephanie, I don't know why you are confused that um, we are talking about the universe in Durham. Durham is the center of the universe. There's no surprise. Now, so um, some of you may have um, already been to see this amazing show on the cathedral. And um, if you haven't, let me recommend that you drop everything and go there tonight, because really it's an exceptional show, and uh, it's a collaboration between the Institute for Computational Cosmology at the university here, uh, the history department, and three brilliant artists, uh, Ross Ashton, John Del Nero, and Isabel um, Weller Bridges. So I was uh, asking some people last night who've seen the show, and I said, you know what it is about? I said, well, it has to do with the Big Bang. And that is absolutely true. So what I thought I would do today is tell you a little bit of the progress that there has been over the last 30 years in this branch of science, trying to understand our universe, how it came to be. And that it, when you see when you see the show on the cathedral, it is actually reflected in there as seen through the eyes of these brilliant artists. So um, the um, but Lumiere, was, we were told last night, started in Durham, but I will trace back the ancestry of Lumiere to the very origin of light. And I'm going to start by telling you about the very first light in the universe. Uh, before I do that, let me just tell you three facts that you should all know about the universe. Uh, first one is that uh, most of the universe is almost empty. You wouldn't think so when you go to Lumiere, but that is um, on scales much larger than Durham. And uh, extragalactic space is very dark. However, it's not completely empty or completely dark because uh, extragalactic space is bathed by the residual heat left over from the Big Bang. So this residual heat, I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. It's the first light in the universe, and it's everywhere. If you go out, even in Durham, and stick your hand out, it doesn't matter if it's cloudy, then every second you will get, your hand will be hit per square centimeter by about 100 particles of light that have been propagated all the way from the Big Bang until they encountered your hand for the first time. So the um, uh, cosmology, of course, about the Big Bang then. And um, here is a, a picture of the Big Bang uh, beginning 14 billion years ago. And it shows in a cartoon fashion how the universe has been expanding cooling as it does so, creating the conditions necessary for the emergence of atoms, molecules, and eventually stars, planets, and us. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that, uh, but uh, let's go back to the very beginning. So near the Big Bang, the universe was so dense that um, all the matter in today's visible universe, and remember the Milky Way has 100 billion stars, and the visible universe has 100 billion galaxies, all that matter was actually contained in a tiny little region that fitted inside a proton, an elementary particle. Now, of course, um, when matter gets so dense, it also gets very hot. So the beginning of the universe was immensely hot. And um, it was also foggy. The early universe was foggy. And that is because it was so hot, and we're talking about 14 billion years ago, it was so hot that, in fact, atoms couldn't exist. So atoms were broken up into protons and electrons, and the light would scatter all these electrons, and that's what causes fog. So the early universe was very hot, and it was very foggy. However, something very important happened uh, 380,000 years after the Big Bang, which uh, by our scales here may seem like a rather long time, but not for the universe. The universe is 14 billion years old, so 380,000 years would be the human equivalent of one day. So when the universe was a baby universe, one day old, something very important happened. The universe had cooled enough that the fog from the Big Bang lifted, and that is when the first light was emitted for a few small amount of time, by cosmological standards, the universe became immensely bright, as bright as the surface of the sun. And that is the origin of this radiation that bathes the universe today. It's called the microwave background radiation because it's so cool, uh, it's, cold, it's cool so much that it's now uh, seen as uh, microwaves. And uh, that, uh, so as, as I said, as the universe expanded, the radiation began to cool, and um, that radiation has been propagating ever since until it hits your hand. If you go outside or if you are lucky, it hits your telescope. That radiation was discovered in 1964 by these two gentlemen who, of course, won the Nobel Prize for their discovery. 
and uh, their discovery and made history as well because it was the detection of this heat left over from the Big Bang, which is one of the great triumphs, not only of Big Bang theory, it's one of the pillars of why cosmologists uh, work in the Big Bang, but it's also one of the great scientific achievements of all time. So that's where uh, Lumiere goes back to. Uh, but in fact, uh, because the radiation is cooling very, uh, very rapidly, uh, the universe, after this little flash of light, and you see that projected on the cathedral, then became dark again in what we call the cosmic dark ages because the radiation cooled, became dark, and then the universe was lit up again about a billion years after the beginning by when the first stars and the first galaxies began to form. I'm gonna show you a movie of that in a minute. Now, so in order to understand the second burst of light, we need to ask the question of uh, where do the galaxies and the stars come from? And this is an amazing story that I want to share with you. Uh, I don't have much time to go in detail, into details, but uh, when we ask, um, and unfortunately this movie is supposed to play, but it hasn't, when we ask where do galaxies come from, actually the answer is they come from nothing. And um, they come from nothing in physics, uh, by, sorry, in physics, by nothing, we mean uh, something very concrete, we mean the vacuum. Now, uh, I don't have a time to give you a lecture on quantum physics, but the vacuum is actually not empty. The vacuum is actually full of bits of energy that come and go, uh, things we call quantum fluctuations. So galaxies actually come from nothing, and uh, that nothingness manifested itself very soon after the Big Bang. You see this little line here changes uh, direction, and that is a period that we know as cosmic inflation, when the universe expanded very rapidly uh, in a very short period of time. This happened 10 to the minus 35 seconds after the Big Bang, and because this was related to these quantum processes, fluctuations were happening all the time, and some of these fluctuations caused small irregularities in the uh, density of the universe at early times. And it is those small irregularities that eventually led to stars, galaxies, and to us. These are called quantum fluctuations. Now, so the early universe then was uh, seeded with these small irregularities, and at this point you might think, well, this professor, he must be out of his mind. So I'm telling you that everything we have in the universe came out of this vacuum of nothing, very close to the Big Bang from these fluctuations. And um, I should say, in physics we're allowed to be slightly crazy if we wish, so long as our craziness is testable. And this idea, amazingly, turns out to be testable. And here's how we test it. So these small fluctuations, quantum fluctuations during the period of inflation, as the universe expands, they grow. Uh, not very much, but they grow. And when the microwave background, this residual heat of the Big Bang is emitted, then uh, these fluctuations actually leave an imprint in the temperature as it happens of this background radiation. So theories predicted in the 1980s that the radiation should be uh, not uniform, but to be characterized by hot and cold spots in a pattern like this. So this was a prediction from the 1980s based on these ideas, fundamental ideas about physics and about our universe. Well, in 1992, an American satellite called the COBE satellite took a picture of this radiation, and this is exactly what COBE saw. So this was an amazing breakthrough in our understanding of the universe. Uh, of course, he got the Nobel Prize in physics as well, and it made uh, headline news all over the world. Here is uh, this uh, memorable uh, newspaper for various reasons, including the fact that if you read carefully here, it says uh, Carlos Frank, an astronomer at Dunham University, said yesterday, oh wow. And, uh, <laughs> and that's exactly what I said. <laughs> because it really was a wow moment. Now this radiation has been measured now with much greater precision by a European satellite called Planck. And, um, uh, now, physicists are able not just to make a nice picture like this of what uh, the sky should look like, and I should say that the picture I show you of the sky, what you're seeing there is a picture of, if you like, the temperature of the baby universe. So the plot I just showed you a minute ago with hot and cold spots, you're actually seeing our universe when it was a, a mere one day old. But physicists are able not just to, to make predictions for this map, we can calculate in detail properties of this radiation. I don't want to get into any technical details, you don't need to know what this line means, but it, it's a property that we use to characterize these fluctuations in the temperature of this radiation. So that were predictions that were made again in the 1980s, and here are the data from Planck. Now, what you, so for the uh, specialists here, if there are any, 
Well, what's actually plotted here is just the temperature difference between two points in the sky. It's a function of how far apart they are. It doesn't really matter. What matters is this amazing picture, which is, I think, one of the great triumphs. I would say not just of cosmology or physics. I would say it's a triumph of human ingenuity and, and human talent. Because what we have here in green is a line uh, that describes how our universe began. And I often wonder why is it that in this small planet, in the outskirts of the Milky Way galaxy, a species evolved capable of actually making theoretical prediction using the beautiful language of mathematics about how our universe began. That's the green li line here. And then the species is also capable of constructing machines that we launch outside our planet capable of making measurements shown here in red of exquisite accuracy. And look at this, the data shown in red agrees exactly with the predictions of the theory uh, made in the 1980s. And let me say, I think physics doesn't get any better than this, and for me, life doesn't get any better than this. <laughs> it's just amazing. <laughs> Thank you, and uh, I think this does deserve a round of applause, because, <laughs> not me, but... <laughs> but Okay, so now where does that leave us? And um, well, this is very interesting because not only does it tell us about how our universe began, but it also allows us to now try and figure out where do we come from? Where does our galaxy, where does our sun come from? And, uh, uh, and the problem is now very well posed because we have essentially the initial conditions, the starting state, these small fluctuations, these quantum fluctuations as reflected in the temperature of the background radiation. And, uh, how do we go from these initial conditions to galaxies? Well, we just need to calculate, and we know how to do that. Uh, let me tell you that that's what we do at my institute. We do simulations, as Stephanie said, of the evolution of the universe. And there's nothing magical about that. It's actually relatively straightforward. We need to know one more thing about our universe that I haven't told you about yet, uh, and that is that um, another a stunning discovery of the last 20 years or so has been the realization that our universe contains quite bizarre materials. Uh, only about 5% of what the universe contains is normal matter. That's a matter made of atoms of which we, uh, and the sun, are made of the uh, chemical elements that you see in the periodic table. Only 5% of the universe is that. About 25% is matter, which is also matter, but very different from the ordinary matter. It's not made of these atoms. Uh, it's made of something different. And we, it doesn't shine. It's completely dark. Uh, and we call that dark matter. And then the rest is something we call dark energy. Now, the dark energy affects the way the universe expands, but it doesn't really play a role in what I want to tell you next in the next couple of minutes, which is how galaxies form. Now, the best assumption for the dark matter is that it's some kind of elementary particle created soon after the Big Bang, and um, it's known as cold dark matter for reasons I can tell you during the coffee break. So how do you make a uh, virtual universe? Well, we have the initial conditions. We need to make some assumption about the contents of the universe, just as I just show you. Uh, and then, and then all you need to do really is to solve these fundamental equations of physics, general relativity, mechanics, hydrodynamics, atomic physics that, that are difficult to solve, but happily uh, computers are very good at this. Computers are extremely good at solving equations. And so we feed the initial conditions, we feed the equations of physics to a big computer, and we just let it churn away for uh, sometimes months on end uh, until out comes a virtual universe. And so uh, to finish off, I don't know if this is going to work. Here it is. This is a, a simulation, a movie from a very recent computer simulation that's won some prizes already in scientific circles. Here's the time clicking in some strange units that you won't understand, but this is about a billion years after the Big Bang. <laughs> and what you see here is the dark matter. We say it's a, it's a professional movie. Uh, and we're going to zoom now into a particularly interesting region of space here. What you see here is the evolution of the ordinary matter. And uh, you see here uh, these quantum fluctuations, these small perturbations in the early universe, how they have grown under the action of the gravity of the dark matter. And um, uh, these lumps are pulled together by gravity. You don't see the dark matter here. You only see the visible matter. And that's what's come out of our computer, doing nothing other than feeding in the initial conditions and solving the equations of physics. And uh, now we're going to zoom out and uh, show uh, briefly that um, uh, look have a more uh, panoramic perspective of this patch of universe that we have simulated. And this simulation took one of the biggest supercomputers in the world uh, working flat out for several months. And um, you can see that galaxy. Have you ever seen galaxies in the real universe? You might have seen them, at least in the newspapers. They look a lot like this. <coughs> so,
And here you can see a representative patch of universe. It's not the real universe. It came out of a computer. So now these are examples of uh, uh, galaxies that we, we can now make in computers. Those of you who have seen real galaxies in, through a telescope or in a book, difficult to tell the difference. So let me then finish off there. So I've been telling you this uh, sort of cosmic story that you will see reflected uh, in the cathedral. And uh, I should say uh, that, uh, that I, I mentioned that uh, the uh, projection of the cathedral involves some of these ideas, but also some ideas from colleagues in the history department here, because cosmology is not the subject that we've invented, something that has worried people for, for hundreds, thousands of years. And so there's a historical aspect to that uh, inspired by colleagues in the history department here. The story then, uh, they don't go as back as 10 to the minus 35 seconds, the historians of science, but, uh, or the historians, but the story began very soon after the Big Bang with this vacuum and, and these quantum fluctuations. Uh, these quantum fluctuations uh, were uh, reflected in the temperature, the heat left over from the Big Bang, which provides the initial conditions for the formation of structure in the universe, and using big computers, we're able to recreate now the way in which the universe evolves. And so let me then just leave you here with um, uh, this beautiful picture of my favorite building on Earth. And um, just to say that we have really learned a lot about our universe in the last 30 years, but still a lot more to learn. And I see the clock says zero here. So uh, before I annoy Stephanie more, I will stop here.